Wow, what a beautiful place. What great decorations these young folks in here have worked so hard to put together. I mean, I am amazed. This is fantastic. A lot, a lot of work, and it's falling apart right now, I understand. No. <laughs> oh, goodness. And so we're excited about VBS this, this week and just we're going to need your prayers. So we're going to do some special prayer in just a moment for that. And, uh, but I want to take a moment. When I came in, I want to make sure everyone got this. So when I came in, did you get, uh, did everybody get the men? Did you get your little chain? If you didn't get one, I don't know where they are. Bob, you didn't get one? No. Who, who has these? Somebody, I'm, I'm talking about uh, who was passing these out. Okay, Harper, Carson, we got a guy back here that needs one. He'll, he'll go home mad if he don't get his. We don't want that to happen. Okay, so we do want to say happy, happy Father's Day to all the dads that are here today. And uh, matter of fact, let's just have the dads stand up and give them a good handshake, okay? All our fathers, let's... And uh, God, God bless you, dads. Being here in church today, you can be seated and uh, say a few things in our message about fathers. And I think one of the best things you can do for your children uh, to be an example for them. But also at this time, I want to take a moment to say something about Cash, who works back here in our media center. He, when I get here on Sundays, and I get here fairly early, um, he is always here. He's here before anyone else. He's been so faithful to work back here in the media center, and he does an awesome job making sure the right words are on the screen at the right time, because if it was up to Brother Randy back there, and y'all don't know who he is, I can say that. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we would be in a mess, but uh, but anyway, we, we appreciate cash. But uh, t but today he actually uh, talked to him yesterday. His dad is taken to the hospital uh, pretty suddenly with uh, sickness, and uh, and we had some prayer with him yesterday. But this morning, cash. Uh, texted me really early, about 12.30, I think it was this morning, and his dad had just passed away. And uh, then Cash is here today, so we want to remember Cash in prayer. On this Father's Day is the day he is saying goodbye to his earthly dad. And uh, we're so thankful, and I noticed today in my psalm, Psalm 68, that God said, I will be a father to the fatherless. And so all of us at one time or another, like myself, had to say goodbye to earthly father. But whether we had a good earthly father or a bad earthly father, or didn't have a earthly father that we even knew like my wife, she does not know who her biological father is. We know that we have a God who says, I'll be a father to the fatherless. And we know God's gonna put cash in his arms in a special way today and, uh, and be there for you, cash. So God bless you. And then we also want to take a moment to uh, have all our Vacation Bible School workers to come up here, to come on up here if you don't mind. And uh, so if you're involved in VBS in one way or the other, you help build the set, you help do anything with VBS, okay? And get ready for this week. I want you to come up here and we're going to pray over you. And I think it's just really, uh, we're begging for your prayers, begging for your prayers for VBS, VBS workers. This week, one of my devotions was about uh, the salvation of D.L. Moody. He was a young boy going to Sunday school, and he'd go to sleep in Sunday school. So he wasn't maybe the best, maybe student in Sunday school. And his teacher, Mr. Kendall, had a passion for him and a burden for him and finally said, I'm going to go lead him to the Lord. And so he went to the, he went to the uh, little store. It's a shoe store where D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody, worked. And uh, he went in that shoe store and said, hey, I want to talk to you about your relationship with Christ. And Dwight Moody gave his heart to the Lord. Now, Mr. Kendall just thought, well, you know, he's just a little kid. I don't know. You know, and felt like maybe he's a failure. Even his witness to him, he didn't feel like it was the best witness at the right time, et cetera, and so forth. But guess what? Dwight Moody got saved that day. Dwight Moody went on to become one of the great evangelists in America. When he was in England, he was having a crusade there because of his success in America. And uh, there was a great preacher there at his time called F.B. Meyer. 
And F.B. Meyer didn't really like D.L. Moody because he wasn't very educated and he had these messages he didn't think were very deep and such. But when he went to hear him, he sensed the anointing of God and became very acquainted with him, loved him. And Dwight Moody invited him to America. And so he came to America, and while he was preaching, he touched another pastor that got his heart really on fire because of FBI's message. And that mess, that guy got a, a guy by the name of Billy Sunday uh, to go out and evangelize, who was a in, big baseball player. And Billy Sunday helped reach a guy by the name of Mordecai Ham for the Lord. And there was a group in Charlotte, North Carolina, wanted to have a revival meeting. And they didn't really feel like it was going very well, but Mordecai Ham came down there to do a, a revival meeting in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And, and guess who was at that meeting? A high school kid by the name of Billy Graham. And you just never know when that Sunday school teacher won that one little boy to Christ, how a chain of events take place where a Billy Graham gets saved and the world hears the gospel of Jesus Christ like it would have never heard it. And so when we do Bible school this week, we do not know what Billy Graham or Dwight Moody or who might be in here, a Henry Martin that we'll talk about at the end of our message that gets touched by the spirit of the living God and says, here I am, Lord, send me. So I just want to take a moment to pray for these workers. Father, really we all are involved if we tithe, if we give, if we come to church here regularly. We're a part of this week in Bible school. And uh, as we serve this week and uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and next Sunday in, in different areas of ministry to the boys and girls from the community and from our church that will come, Lord, we're desperate. We're desperate for your Holy Spirit to fill us, to give us a heart full of love and compassion. Lord, even this week as our church spreads out across the community, wherever they live or wherever they work, to take the time to invite uh, their friends to bring their children to Bible school here at Friendly this week. And we're just going to believe that, Lord God, you're going to do something special. And uh, something's going to take place in the hearts of boys and girls that's going to prepare them for eternity. And who knows but one of these children become a pastor of a church like Friendly one day or become an evangelist that will win hundreds of thousands or a missionary that will reach an unreached people group with the gospel of Christ. So, Lord God, we just pray for your anointing, your blessings, your protection, for your encouragement. Lord, we pray as we're going to preach this morning that you give us a passion, that you stir up our hearts as a church for these boys and girls in our community that desperately in this crazy world need a relationship with the eternal, ever-living God, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would do these things, and we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say... Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. And God bless you. And again, thank you for being a part of working with us in VBS. And I had a, something to kind of get our service started off here, but somebody took my folder. I had a folder here on the front row. We need our children. You're dismissed. Our children can be dismissed. Oh, I can't see. <laughs> All right. I got my glasses on. Okay, you know you're getting old. Okay. So last Sunday we began a series of messages on 52 days with Nehemiah. 52 days with Nehemiah. And we passed out a uh, paper that uh, was going to kind of help you understand what we're talking about. And also that you can put in your Bible... And we're asking you to make an, a commitment for 52 days that will actually start on June the 25th. That's all on this paper. So, uh, Aiden, would you help me here? And if you weren't here last Sunday or you need another one of these, let us just raise your hand and Aiden will get it around to you, okay? And, uh, and it's, uh, you'll, you'll just notice on this sheet of paper, we're talking about 52 days building a great life or rebuilding a great life. And uh, making sure that we have a great life for the glory of God. We have a great church. We want to see God just do awesome things through children's ministry and youth ministries here. And through our leadership of our church. And through the pastor that God's going to bring to this church. And we just believe that it's going to take a great, great amount of passion and believing that God, we need more of them. Okay, here, I got a whole bunch here. Here we go. Yeah, we'll make sure. Make sure you, you take this 
and you can fold it over, you can put it in your Bible, and then you noticed, uh, and the reason I'm doing this for three Sundays before we actually start is because <laughs> I know that everybody doesn't come on one Sunday, you know, so I'm hoping over three Sundays we'll just about catch everyone, hopefully. And, uh, but the 52-day commitment would include daily prayer, where you'll say for 52 days, I will on purpose stop for at least five minutes and take time to pray. And in that prayer time, we've given some suggestions. Pray for a lost friend. Pray for an unreached people group. And we listed some seven unreached people groups that I know of. Some of these I've been amongst. I've been with them, the Bokhar in Russia. I've been with these people many times. And they live in the mountains there on, in southern Russia. Uh, the, we've uh, been with the Chinchu, the Banjari, the Mina, and, uh, and the Koya people in India. And these are people that need Jesus Christ. They're considered unreached, hundreds and thousands of them that do not have a gospel witness in many of their villages. And so maybe you would pray for one of them. You'd pray for a missionary. You'd pray specifically for our church missionaries. And when we listed a couple that we'll mention here, Amber Hassan and Andre, who is dear friends of mine, one in Haiti, and she's in a very dangerous place. And Andre, he's in, uh, in Ukraine right now, serving with uh, taking care of meeting the needs in a city that's right on the border with Russia, risking his life. And, uh, but, but boy, they just beg us to pray for them. So maybe you'd pray for one of them in that five minutes time. Uh, we're asking that you would just say, hey, I'll take time every day to read my Bible. At least five minutes, five minutes, okay? So we're talking 10 minutes. And I just keep thinking, how much time do we watch the news? How much time do we watch a sports event or do something else? Can't we just say, hey, I want to do some things. I understand it takes 21 days in a row to start a habit. And there are good habits and there's bad habits in our lives. But we need to have some good habits. Now, we shouldn't read our Bible just out of habit. Amen. There should be something, and that's what we preach out today, about today, that it stirs our heart to do it. But, but then, so Bible reading, just some different things you can do and challenges. And you can ask the Lord, how do you want me to do this? And let him guide you. Sharing your faith during that 52 days. Would you share your faith with at least one person? One, in 52 days, would you hand out a track? Would you invite somebody to church? Uh, would you take a gospel track and say, could I go th through this track with you? But share your faith with a lost person. Maybe invite them to a meal, as I said. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord in a local ministry or visit a shut-in or volunteer at Vacation Bible School. Oh, that just worked its way in there. Or <laughs> you would uh, encourage have an encouraging ministry, write a letter to a missionary, write a letter to a lost person. And I wrote, write a letter to blank, somebody that God just puts on your heart that you just think, wow, what if they got a card from me? You know, and, and what a difference. I want to tell you, I'm, I'm convinced I got saved because someone wrote me a letter. Now, I'd grown up in church. I'd heard the gospel. I'd made a profession of faith. But I was 19 years old. I thought I had the world by the tail on a downhill swing. Things were just all going my way. And I went to visit my, I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, working a great job and just good things happened all around me. But, but something was missing in my heart. And I went to Lynchburg to visit my parents over the Christmas holidays and I went to the high school, the Christian high school, Lynchburg Christian Academy, and the coach there was good friends with my sister, and he led us in the gym, and we played some basketball. His name is Danny, Danny Manley. We played some basketball. The next week, Danny wrote me a handwritten letter and sent it to Cincinnati, Ohio, got my address somehow, and said, hey, Mike, it was great playing basketball with you. It's nice meeting you. And I uh, sure hope that maybe when you come back, we'll play some more basketball or something like that. It was just a simple letter, but he took the time just to write me a letter. And I thought, wow, wow, maybe this guy's a real Christian. Yeah. And something touched my heart. And I'm convinced that letter played a major role in me over the next few weeks. I got saved in February. That was in December. But I got saved the next February 21st. And I'm convinced that letter paid. So write a letter. 
to someone, give to a local ministry, uh, encouraging them, uh, call an absentee, find out, call, call uh, uh, Michelle and say, who, 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 who do you think hasn't been to church in a while? <laughs> She'll give you a name and just call them and just say, I'm so-and-so, I go to Friendly and I, I just knew you used to come here and I'd love to reach out to you and just say hello and we miss you. Something like that. And an encouraging ministry. In 52 days, there's a lot of things you could do that will make a major difference and help your life have great purpose and help this church be a great church to win this community for Jesus Christ. Because this church is only as great as the people in it are great for God, making themselves available for God to work through them. So I hope you will take this and, and, and take it serious and let it be a special part of your life. Amen? Amen. Well, we're, we're here to encourage you. I think my main gift that I found over the years, my wife has told me also, is, is exhortation. Exhortation. And that's that's the ministry of helping people do what they ought to do for the glory of God. <laughs> Encouraging you to do what you ought to do for his name's sake. And so this is a, something the Lord put on my heart years ago, 52 days with, with Nehemiah. Now, interesting, Sunday school this morning, understand, was on Nehemiah. Is that right? Cora and so the Sunday school teachers and so and, and we didn't coordinate all that ahead of time and so that gets interesting to me that God like in eternity past already is coordinating the, the, the times together in church here for us adults and also for our children. So we're going to be talking about today a great work involves a great passion, a great passion. We're talking about through this series, rebuilding, because Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls that had been torn down. It means refocusing, reevaluating, reassessing. And how do I know I'm doing a great work for God? How do we know our church is doing a great work for God? And when you study the book of Nehemiah, at least 20 times the word great is used. You know, I, I love being able to say, my God is a great God. Amen. He is the greatest of the greatest. He's the most high God. There's none like him. And, and God doesn't do anything in a mediocre way. He is, he does everything in a great way. Just, just look at the universe. Just look in the mirror. And I know you might think, wow, he messed up on me, but he didn't. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in his very image. And every work of God is a great work. And he wants you to be a great person for his namesake and do great things for him. And the word great used 20 times in the book of Nehemiah. In old King James, it's actually 27 times in the book of Nehemiah. And so we're going to be talking about a great passion, and that's today. And that's a burden that we could have and this burning desire in our hearts to do the will of God. A great purpose. That's the vision, the possibilities, the priorities, the great prayer that God wants us to have. You're going to see the book of Nehemiah is a book of great prayer. And if a church is going to accomplish anything for the Lord, I can't wait till we speak on this subject, the great prayer. The church has to be a great praying church. Amen. And uh, your pastor that we're going to call and God's going to send here, we want him to be a great praying pastor. More than anything else, we want him to know that he prays and he prays for us. He prays for this church. He prays for the glory of God in this community. And he has contact with God through prayer. Great patience. And that's waiting on God's timing. Waiting on God's timing. And I'll guarantee you, matter of fact, one of the, one of the signs of an apostle, the apostle Paul said, was patience. One of the proofs that they were in a pot was patience. Because if you are going to serve God and you're going to be and do great things for God, you're going to need great patience. Amen. That means perseverance, enduring. That means holding on when there's nothing to hold on to. You learn to hold on to him. And then you're going to face great problems, obstacles. And boy, we'll look at that message. That's probably out of the whole series, maybe my favorite message. And then there's a great price to pay. Um, 
a great price to pay. If you're, if you're going to, anybody does anything great is willing to pay a price to do it. They really are. You know that. And there's a price that we have to pay if we're going to glorify God. You know what that price is, real simply? We lay down our lives for his name's sake. And, uh, and he honors that. And then I'll guarantee you we'll see great progress. And uh, the wall was built in 52 days. Great protection, great provision, great plenty. God does all those things. Now, today we're going to talk about passion. And passion has to do with our heart. It's that internal fire that motivates and energizes us to fulfill our purpose and do God's will. And we have to say this many times. God is the source of our spiritual passion. The source of our spiritual passion will come from God and his word and his Holy Spirit. And as we go through the message today, I'm praying God will put that in your heart. So let's stand together and we're going to read from Nehemiah chapter 1, just four verses to start off our message today. Nehemiah chapter 1, just the first four verses. The introduction to the book and to our message today. So the words of Nehemiah, which basically we believe Nehemiah probably wrote this book as an autobiography, his story of how God worked in his life to do a great work for God. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, it came to pass in the month of Chesla in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the Shushan, the citadel or the palace in some versions, that Hananiah, one of the brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. Did you hear that? So he was told that the survivors that are in the province are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And I don't know what you picture in your mind when you see a city, the walls are down, the gates are burned with fire, no protection, no security, poverty. And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, Father in heaven, I ask in these next moments that you will help us, if we don't have it today, to get a renewed passion, a renewed passion for you, for your word, for your work, Lord, for our families, for our children. Lord, give us a passion that comes from you. And Lord, do something special in the hearts of this church as we're in a transition period and looking for that man of God, that pastor that you'll bring our way. Lord, we need that passion, that burning desire in our hearts to please you and to do your will. And we ask that you would use this message and use the life of Nehemiah and the story of Nehemiah and the word of God to do that work in our lives today. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated. So we're going to look at an occasion when God restored the passion of his people. In verse 3, it says, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. That's the before. That's the before. That's what Nehemiah heard. That's what was happening. And you can just imagine the extreme makeover that the city of Jerusalem and the people needed and how God would ignite a new fire within these people, broken people. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, though, we see their new passion in 4, 6. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind 
to work. And I, that's one of my favorite verses, I think, in the Bible, as I've been a part of church work and church ministry all these years. Not that the pastor has a hard work in ethics and all that, but the people, the church and people in the church. And God bless me in every church I've been a part of to have a great group of people around me who had a mind to work. I had a pastor one time ask me, because we had about four staff members that they were all school teachers, they were all athletics guys, they were all coaches in the local high schools, and God worked in their lives. And so we were starting that church up in Winchester, Bob and Ron and Eric, these coaches, they joined with me. And, uh, and so we started a Christian school, and they literally, that year, instead of signing contracts in June and May or even earlier with the public school system where they had been working for years, they didn't sign the contracts because we were going to start a school that fall. And they, by faith, we didn't have any students. We didn't even have a finished building at that point. And we said, we're going to start a school. And they, by faith, joined us to do that. These, these three guys and myself, we became the four musketeers, I think. And, and, and we just didn't have enough sense but to trust God. And they trusted God. They were hardworking guys. And, and, and my, my job as their pastor, and they were all older than me. I was younger than every one of them. And, and I can remember, I, I didn't have to motivate them. I didn't have to say, hey, where are you today? How come you're not here? They were 24-7 guys, I'm telling you. They, they had a mind to work. They had a mind to serve God. And one day a pastor asked me, and he says, how do you get your staff to get to church on time? How do you get them there to do what they're supposed to be doing? How do you hold them accountable? And I go, wow, that's foreign. I, I, I've never... I never even had the thought that I had to do that. My, I, all I'm trying to do is like, I got the reins on a horse just going crazy and I'm trying to guide it in the right direction. These guys have a mind to work. And I love how God has put people around me for years that had the mind to work. And my job was just to say, hey, we better go in this direction right now. And they're saying, let's charge hell with a water bucket. And I'm going, amen, let's go. And, and so these people went from being, you know, apathetic and indifferent and let the wall to being a people that had a mind to work and did some great work for God. Matter of fact, the message translation says the people had a heart for the work. I love the NLT, and it says the people had worked with enthusiasm. And we're going to come back to that word, word later. And you just get the feel from reading these translations what was taking place. Their spiritual passion was renewed. And then in Nehemiah chapter 6, going over a couple more chapters, verses 15 and 16, you see the effect of this restored spiritual passion. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of UL in 52 days, in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes. And listen to this. Do you see that on the screen? For they perceived that this work was done. Do you see it? By our God. Man, don't, to me, that's the greatest thing that can happen to a church in a community. That the people in the community see that, well, we know those people that go to that church. We know the Hortons and we know the Randys in the back. I mean, the... Mark back there, we know wait we 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 know these these uh these people down on the front row here. <laughs> Mark and Rosemary and Caleb, I got your first names right. Grover. He he's I have a friend, one of my best friends for years has been Grover Orndolph. That's his first name, Grover. So I have a hard time saying that as a last name for some reason, okay? And uh so thank you, Lord, for helping me remember at least. And, and, but they, 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 they said, I know these guys go to that church. I know it's not them. <laughs> it has to be something else. It must be God. Amen? Amen. It must be God. And, and the people's enthusiasm for doing God's work accomplished three results. Great success was achieved. 
people were discussing the accomplishments of God's people. And of course, God was glorified. Amen. And so when a great ha work happens, that's what takes place. Now, you, you know as well as I know, people get passionate about many things. M my wife is passionate about college football. Literally, she really is. Not me, but she is. You'd think it'd be the other way. But, but uh, she has withdrawals after January <laughs> because college football is gone for at least till August. And, uh, and, and she's really passionate about the University of Michigan. And you don't want to come to our house when the University of Michigan is playing Ohio State. And if, cause especially if you're for Ohio State, you better, you better have on the blue, okay? Uh, because she's passionate about uh, M Michigan beating Ohio State. And so, so we get passionate about our sports. Amen. Our kids play in sports and fishing and hunting and, 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 and people, man, these hunters, man, they'll, I can't get them to church on Sundays because it's too early, you know, 10 o'clock, but they get up at four o'clock to go sit in the cold woods <laughs> and freeze to death to get a shot at the deer, maybe, you know, because they're passionate about their hunting. They're passionate about their work, what might be teaching or selling or managing. They're passionate about their families, and they should be their husband, their wife, their children, their grandchildren. Maybe passionate about their history. You need people that are passionate about their ancestry. And they can only talk about their DNA and who they're finding out in their family, et cetera, and so forth, and how far back they go. Some people are passionate about their politics. This dear lady not too far from here, Got, got the coronavirus and she was, she was in a coma state at the hospital and they were trying to figure if she was, she was uh, like cognitive or able to hear what was going on. And, uh, and so they, they told her, your husband voted for Biden. <laughs> she was such a big Trump fan that they figured if they told her that and she heard it, her heart rate and everything else would change on the monitor because <laughs> she was so passionate about her politics and Trump. And, uh, and that's okay. But we get passionate about those things. They get passionate about their cause, which might be some social issue. And we know in the world that we live in, natural passion is a key to success and impact. Knowing information is important, but possessing the, but possessing the fire is invaluable. Nothing in major in history was ever accomplished without zeal. It's the deciding difference between successful and unsuccessful people in every field of endeavor. The fire on the inside affects everything on the outside. William Ward said this, enthusiasm and persistence can make an average person superior. Indifference and lethargy can make a superior person average. My friend, God is the spiritual passion. He's the source of spiritual passion. And the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost with what? Tongues of fire that's set upon the people. And he comes to ignite us with holy fire. Passion is that inner fire, that desire that drives you and motivates you. Fulfilling your purpose requires passion, fervency, enthusiasm. Now listen to this statement. I believe it'll be on the screen. Purpose has to do with our head. Thinking right about what, why we're here and understanding our calling. That's purpose. And we'll talk about that another time. But passion has to do with our heart, the internal fire that motivates us and energizes us to fulfill our purpose and to do God's will. And that's a real simple message this morning. So where did Nehemiah's passion and zeal, enthusiasm and burden come from? First, it came when he was willing to look beyond. Now, as far as we know, Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem. He'd never been there. He, he was probably born in captivity, maybe in Babylon. He became under the king of Cyrus and the king, the Medo, the Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. And so he's never been to Jerusalem. Okay. He knows he's a Jew, of course. 
because they kept good track of their ancestry. But he, but he'd never been there. He, at this point, he's pretty well advanced in his position. He's a cupbearer of the king. Last week we talked about, if you were here, how that maybe he was like uh, the master of ceremonies for the court. I mean, he was well respected. As you well know, when you read this passage of scripture, the book of Nehemiah, to the king himself. But Nehemiah took time to look over the wall. As we said last week, maybe he heard, heard some people speaking in his native tongue, Hebrew. And he thought, oh, that's some people that, in fact, they're talking. And, and he goes, hey, hey, where are you from? And Hananiah, where are you from? Well, we've been to Jerusalem. Hey, what does it look like there? What's going on? And he started asking questions. And as he heard about what was going on and things that were going on that were not good, he began to develop a passion for the things of God. He looked beyond. Now, sometimes this happens by way of special providence of God that gets us involved in God's work. A lady came to me. Her son was born with autism. And, uh, and, and, and her heart was, of course, concerned about her son growing up. She said, hey, pastor, we need a special needs ministry in our church. And I said, well, maybe you need to get involved in special needs ministry in our church. And as we talked and chatted about what we could do, we decided, hey, let's start a Blue Ridge Autism Center. And we'll just use our church facilities. And uh, Josh and uh, another boy that we knew that had autism that was best friends with her, uh, her the mother was best friends with her, Pam Webb and uh, little Joe. So, so we started with two students. And Angie, she developed a passion. Why? Because God providentially brought Josh into her family and her best friend had a son with autism. And she had this passion and this passion drove her and to start this autism center that went from two students with a $25,000 budget to when I left, they had their own facility and their budget was almost $10 million a year with 150 employees. And they've combined with another one now that makes an impact. Her passion, it was obvious to us. It's dear, dear, dear friend, Keith Farmer. I just talked with him yesterday. Keith Farmer is one of the most amazing men I've ever met in my life. He's the founder and director of a place called Straight Street, helping young people at risk in the inner city of Roanoke, Virginia. And uh, you know where it started? He was at, working in a little church back in the city uh, that uh, had an Awana program on Wednesday nights. And as he was working with these youth, it just kind of caught his heart. Man, they need something more than just a Wednesday night program. And he began to get a passion for helping these children where they lived and where they were. And God then put it in his heart to start Straight Street. And I'm telling you, he is the most connected person I've ever met in my life with court officials, with school officials, and anything that he and I, he became one of our elders in our church, one of my best friends. And uh, I had just said one day, hey, I used to do a Bible study downtown with business people, but uh, they, that company where we were doing it moved out of town. And uh, it's been some time since I was doing that. But actually, it all started when I just got a passion to say, I, I think I've lost touch with the inner city. And so I said, can I come down on Wednesdays and just meet with you and just walk around town with you and sit there at Straight Street and pray? So we began doing that. And then out of that, we said, hey, let's start something for the business people. And I just said it. But then he says, let's start it now. <laughs> And, and the next thing you know, we had a first Thursday of every month with dozens, even up to 80 people that would come to hear the word of God, police officers and probation officers and city officials and men, people from the congressman's office. They would come the first Thursday of every month. I think mainly because Edith made some really good soup that we served and gave them a free meal. But they had to listen to me for 30 minutes, teach a Bible lesson. And it was a one hour thing. But Keith had this passion. And, 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 and just later on, he got a passion because of the human trafficking that he 
ended up having to deal with from time to time as he worked with the FBI and the local law enforcement people. And he got a passion. And now today, we have a center there for human trafficking victims where they can come and be protected and be restored and be brought back because they don't have a place to go. That's most of them are young kids, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, these girls and need something. And Keith got a passion, raised millions of dollars to do this for the glory of God because he only does what God provides money for. So God sometimes uses providence as you serve where you are, as you get involved, maybe a child in your family, and God begins to burden your heart. There's so many more things I can take, but they talk about, but the, it awakens a passion, a burden, a desire. Uh, it could be a missions presentation where you look on a screen. I'll never forget in some of the first missions conferences, looking at the children on the screen in those foreign countries and thinking they don't know who Jesus is. And it put a passion in my heart for missions. Or going to Haiti a few days after the earthquake, over, over 300,000 people died in that earthquake. And we were there just a couple days after that earthquake. But we met a team of people that we worked with for two weeks there trying to bring relief. The earthquakes were still happening, the tremors, and people were scared and frightful. But God put together a team, and it was an amazing thing as we gave out supplies, as we worked together. That team became passionate and continued to do wonderful things for the glory of God over the next number of years in Haiti, reaching people. So God uses those things to develop that passion within us. So he looked over the wall. He listened to what was going on somewhere else. And that passion began to burn. Notice next in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, when he came to Jerusalem, it says, I came to Jerusalem and I was there for three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. I told no one what God, I told no one what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. God put something in his heart. So how did that happen? So he went in the middle of the night and he did... Uh, a survey of the broken down walls. He, he walked around the city in the middle of the night. And he has this encounter with God. It's a personal encounter. It can happen in a prayer, a worship time, a word from God, a sermon, or some profound personal experience. Jennifer Brenning was visiting Rainbow back a few years ago. She was on the corporate ladder climbing it up in Chicago. And she had grown up with my daughter-in-law, Karen, up in Chicago from fourth grade. They'd gone through school together. She was in Karen's wedding as a bridesmaid. And so she was just visiting from Chicago, sitting in the audience one Sunday morning. And we were talking about missions and winning a world to Christ. And as she was sitting there, guess what happened? God touched Jennifer's heart. Well, you know Jennifer Brother Dennis, she was with us on that on our trip last this year to, to Israel. And she surrendered and she went to northern Iraq and Iran, where she began in Turkey working with these Persian group people. And and, and I'll never forget her calling me one day from Turkey and saying, Pastor, they're having a uh, a coup here. There's an uprising. The military is trying to take over the government. Tanks are going down the street. Bombs are going off. And I'm kind of nervous in this apartment I'm in. <laughs> Would you pray for me? <laughs> but here's a girl that went from her safe zone in Chicago or the corporate ladder and walked, let that be behind her and got a passion for people that needed Jesus Christ in other parts of the world. Oh, my God, help us to get involved. Amen. You know, that's what happened to me because I had no intention of really doing anything like this, being a pastor, being a missionary. But I was working a construction job, and, and I remember upon, we got up to second, third floor, and I would 
just gotten saved and I would look down and see these people walking down the street and I would be thinking, wow, those people, they're, they're lost or they're saved. They're either going to heaven or they're going to hell. I wonder who's going to tell them about Jesus. And those thoughts just would go through my mind as I stood up there. And then I knew God was calling me. But boy, you just don't understand the fear I have of being in front of people in ministry. And, and, and so I was fighting it, actually. And one day I was shooting a gun. It was an Omark gun that shoots a three-inch nail into concrete columns. And I was shooting this gun. And when I did, it hit a rebar just but no, leave, leave the surface of the concrete that hadn't got pushed back far enough. And that nail came out and it blew concrete and I didn't wear goggles, I didn't wear safety stuff. And this was the day when those guns, you just put a gun, you just put a bullet in it and, and it didn't have like the safety parts on it. it, it, it I mean, when it took off, it, the bullet, the nail took off. This was before the safety stuff. And that nail came out and I was, felt something in my arm, and I grabbed my arm. And when I did, I didn't see the nail there because it was buried in my forearm. And I could feel it underneath the skin. And I go, oh, me. And I said something I shouldn't have said. And I, I felt bad about what I said more than the pain of the nail in my arm. <laughs> that was the only time I really sinned after I got saved. <laughs> And uh, I asked God to forgive me real quick. And they took me to the hospital and they cut it out. But God said, that three-inch nail, he said, you know, that nail could have hit you right here. That nail could have hit you right here. It could have hit you anywhere. It just buried itself. They just pulled it out. And it never was a problem at all. And God's saying, listen, Mike, I'm talking to you. And about that same time, I had an evangelist or a missionary come to the church, Landmark Baptist Temple, and he preached a message from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. And he was a missionary to the Philippines, and his message was, I sat where they sat. And he says, would you get on, get on the plane with me right now? And so this big old audience, there's several thousand people there in this big church. He got us all on the plane. We flew over to the Philippines, and he took us to the river, and he says, see all these brown people, these brown-skinned people, they need Jesus. And he says, well, you sat where they sat. And that night, God spoke to my heart. And he said, who will go and tell them? And that night, I raised my hand. And that night, I went to the altar. Nobody prayed with me. Nobody talked with me. But that night, I knew that God stirred my heart. And I don't know what it will take to stir your heart. But that's how God stirred my heart. And God does it in different ways with different people. But this passion must be initiated by God. It was a personal encounter with God first that Nehemiah had. He went where he could encounter God. And then secondly, he says, what God put in my heart. And then third thing about this passion, it requires a response Notice what he said, what God put in my heart to do. <laughs> For me, it meant quitting my job that I loved, what I was doing, and going to Bible college and preparing for ministry. And I'm not sure what it might mean for you. It might mean teaching a Sunday school class. It might mean coming and helping with VBS. It might mean going off to Bible school. I don't know. But God put it in his heart to do something, and that demands a response. Isaiah, when he, the year that King Uzziah died, he was broken, he was down, he was discouraged, and it was that time that he got this vision of the Lord, and he realized he was a man of unclean lips, and he was living amongst an unclean people. And so he gets cleansed by God, and then he overhears the voice of God saying, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? God didn't say, Isaiah, I want you. God says, who will go? Who shall I send? 
And Isaiah now, because he was clean before God, he was willing to do what God wanted him to do. He had an encounter with God. He overheard the voice of God saying, who will I send? And you know the answer. Nehemiah said, here am I, send me. And we have the book of Isaiah and the great ministry of Isaiah to the nation of Israel and the prophecies of the Messiah because of Isaiah saying, here am I, send me. In conclusion, you've got to understand your purpose, why God put you here. We'll be talking about that later. But then to fulfill that purpose, you must have a passion. And you focus your passion on fulfilling your purpose. Passionately love God, love people, change and grow, serve, reach out. We, we are to be a passionate people like God. God desires passionate believers. There's a great church in Atlanta, Georgia. It's called Passion. <laughs> and I like that. God's mission for friendly community is for us to be a group of fervent followers of Jesus Christ, excited about serving him, coming together, worshiping together, and reaching out together to our community and to the far ends of the earth. Passionate Christianity is about living with a sense of urgency and passion. It's living with a vision and a dream to give our lives to and to be a part of a kingdom that we can live for the kingdom of God and bring heaven down to earth and pursue it all intimately. God works through passionate people. Now, passion is not something that's static. It's that it stays the same. And you know, a fire, a fire either spreads or it burns out. And the tendency of a fire if left by itself is to go out, is to go out. Passion works the same way. We've got to work as stoke it and built it and God can help us to see something wonderful happen in our lives and around us. Now there are passion killers too. Complacency, difficult circumstances, unbalanced lifestyle, familiarity, apathy. Apathy isn't a state of mind, it's a state of the heart. And I'm convinced most of the church in America today is in a state of apathy. Now, God knows the moment we lose our passion or our zeal, we lose our vision and perspective. Now, I can tell you, I wake up every morning tired. <laughs> I wake up every morning with my body saying, stay in bed. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe you wake up and say, good morning, Lord. I can't wait to attack the world. That's not me. <laughs> I wake up and say, oh, God, help me. Help me get out of bed. And I talked about this the other week. But I know this. The moment I obey and the moment I realize my calling from God, it's amazing when I sit down to do that five-minute chat between 4.30 or 5.30 or 6 in the morning, and I start talking. I hear it from almost all these people that watch it over the years or the last couple of years. Man, your enthusiasm. You're so enthusiastic. Matter of fact, the deacons, when they met me, they said, you're not that old. Look at all your enthusiasm. I said, yeah, but if you knew how I felt, you wouldn't see it. <laughs> but let me tell you what enthusiasm is. Enthusiasm is not Mike Grooms and my personality. Enthusiasm is me knowing that God is in me. The word entheo, enthuso, enthusio, it's Greek. It means God in, God in you. You know why people take cocaine and heroin and all these crazy drugs? They want to get it in their system so they can feel something, feel better. Hey, listen, I don't need all that stuff. Why? I've got the creator of the universe living inside of me. Amen. Woo! <laughs> Amen. Amen? Yeah. I don't have to try to be energetic or enthusiastic. It just happens because I'm being obedient and God's Holy Spirit 
energizes you when you're being obedient. And so, I don't know, I can get excited no matter where I'm at, what I'm doing, because I know it's the Lord. Now, let me just finish with this. So, will you step out of your security zone? Will you ask God to stir your heart these 52 days? Will you take the time to be obedient to set where they sat? Will you ask God to give you a burden for the lost? Give me a passion for souls, dear Lord. Lord, give me a passion to save the lost. John Wesley said this, the great founder of the Methodist Church. He said, I'd like to hang all my disciples over hell for just five minutes. And he said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. George Whitfield, who brought about the great awakening that probably gave birth to America back in the 1700s, said, Give me, God, give me a deep humility, a well guided zeal, a burning love, and a single eye, and then let men or devils do their worst. Let men or devils do their worst if he had that burning zeal from God. Henry Martin, and I hope you'll take time to look up this man. Henry Martin, his last name spelt M-A-R-T-Y-N, just put missionary in the 1800s. 16 years old, he decided to be an atheist, but God began to work on his heart. He became a missionary to India, and when he knelt on the sands of the beach upon his arrival, he prayed this, here, let me burn out for God. Here, let me burn out for God. That happened on April 21st, 1806. He was 25 years old. Six years later, he died up in Tokat, Turkey on about the 16th of October, 1812 at 31 years of age. And he was a man in six short years who literally burned out for God. But you ought to read his story of what happened in just six years short years of his life and continued to happen for years and years to come because he had a passion for what God put in his heart to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the wonderful testimonies and witness we have of so many people that some of them personally I'm acquainted with as friends, people that we've met. I think of Sanja Crowder, Lord, this dear lady got saved from a life of drugs and alcohol and just a messed up life. And now there's nobody that has the passion for the inner city children and families that she has. Paying a price to love and care and sending me notes almost every week saying, please, please pray. Please, please pray for this one. Pray for that one. Pray for this girl that just murdered somebody that I loved. Pray for her. Oh, God, I just thank you for the influence we've had by people that have passion. And, Lord, we pray that here at Rainbow we'll have a, a church that's passionate about you because we have a people that's passionate about you first, then passionate about what you called them to do and have that enthusiasm, that energy from the Holy Spirit to fulfill the will of God, to do the will of God. And as we're thinking about 52 days, rebuilding our lives, rebuilding the walls, doing a great work for God, what is God speaking to you about what to do that you're not doing right now? Reading your Bible, praying, serving, encouraging. What area is God speaking to you about today? Would you say, here I am, Lord. I make myself available I can't do it, but I know that you can help me to do it if I give my heart to you. Would you pray that? And maybe you're here today and you've never been born again. You've never been saved. You don't know that your sins have been forgiven. Man, I tell you, God loves you so much. That's why Jesus came to die in your place for your sins. He rose again the third day. He's a living Savior. Today he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He paid the price. He paid it all. He gives us free access through his blood 
and his forgiveness of our sins to the Father in a relationship that's real and lasting and eternal. It's the free gift of God. You have to either receive it or reject it. Today, would you receive this free gift? Would you do that right now? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I need the gift of salvation that you provided through your son Jesus. Come into my heart. Forgive me for all my sins. I pray this today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for all that you're going to do this next week through Bible school. Lord, the boys and girls you're going to touch. Lord, we're, we're, we're excited about the pastor you're going to bring to this church. Lord, you know exactly already who that pastor is, who that person, who that man is. God, we, we just pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Be enthusiastic.